Hi, how's it going? This is Brad Cunningham. And this is Scott Reed, and we are partners in a company called Crafting Bites uh, in Carlsbad, and we're currently at our office, and uh, we're here to introduce TIG. Yeah, so we, we run a user group here in San Diego called the Tech Immersion Group. Uh, we've been doing it, uh, I think it's going on five years now, and the idea started really from um, ourselves and one of our other partners who couldn't be here today, Ike Ellis, who who is, uh, you know, really had a thought that the traditional user group that we've been to um, lacked some of the depth that we wanted. So you could get some good high level information. Um, and if you wanted to learn more about a topic, you'd have to go home and do it on your own. So we thought that there's maybe a better way to do a user group. Uh, if we picked a topic and stuck with it for multiple months and got all of the people in the user group to join in with us and um, read a book or follow a web series or something like that that had more depth, then we'd really get to understand the topic um, more fully than you normally get in a user group. Uh, a lot of the times we're learning the topic as well, so we, we help lead the discussion of the group many times, but um, for instance, we just completed the Python track here at TIG and that was a language I had no familiarity with. And so there's a lot of learning that we do. So we, we look at it not really as a teaching, as more of a group discussion. Uh, we're gonna do a, a nerd book review, basically. Um, so as a- uh, Nerd book club. Nerd Book Club. Yeah, there you go. Nerd Book Club. Uh, we encourage questions and participation from the group. We host the meeting um, once a month in our offices here in Carlsbad, where we're at now. And uh, we also live stream the event. Uh, as, as this video will be going out on YouTube, we live stream all the events on YouTube. So we take questions from anybody anywhere in the world if you want to join us. And uh, this, this video is really going to introduce the upcoming topic for TIG that we're going to start this month. And, uh, and Scott will tell you a little bit about that track. Yeah, so we're going to be talking about uh, continuous delivery. Um, our original, I think, name of the topic was DevOps or something like that. But um, really the idea of um, taking your software uh, through to deployment into the customer's hands as fast as possible. And the book that we've chosen is uh, Continuous Delivery. It's a Martin Fowler series. It's uh, Jez Humble and David Farley. And uh, it's quite a long book, um, so I doubt we'll be going through all of it. Um, we're going to be trying to pick out, you know, chapters here and there that we really want to dive into. Um, and the reading assignment for this month will be uh, chapters one and two, which will take you through page uh, 54. Mm -hmm. And, and I think when we started um, discovering what the next track might be, we took a vote and DevOps kept coming up. And, and what we decided in our last meeting was DevOps is a quite nebulous topic and we weren't sure what that really meant. And we took down some notes of what it meant. We said, well, that means things like Docker and things like build automation tools like CI servers and Grunt and Gulp and Octopus Deploy. And the list kept going on and on and on. And so... We decided to settle on this book, um, Continuous Delivery. We thought that it co covered some good concepts on how to deliver continuously and, and what that really means, and it'll touch at a high level on all of the different um, aspects of that. And probably along the way, we're also going to introduce these tool sets, these specific tools that help you solve some of the problems that are discussed in the book. So I think the way this will run is we're going to do a couple of chapters a month and also introduce some tools. Yeah. Um, and the tools will probably be at the meeting, you know, sort of as a interactive uh, a thing. Um, but you'll have to read more of like the theory of why we do it, you know, ahead of time. Yeah. So like Scott said, we're going to do chapters one and two, uh, about 54 pages for the first month's reading. Um, so chapter one, the title of chapter one here is The Problem of Delivering Software. And um, if you read the kind of forward and preface of the book, the one thing they say is everyone should read chapter one. If you know some of these topics after chapter one, you maybe can jump around, but you know everyone should really understand chapter one. Um, so really what they're doing in chapter one here is introducing um, what the problem is that they're trying to solve. Why does this book exist? Why does continuous delivery exist? What are we trying to do? Um, they start out by kind of covering some anti-patterns. And if you've been in software development for any number of years, you probably read through these anti-patterns and go, yep, I've done that. Yep, I've done that. Yep, I've done that. I know this pain that they're talking about. Um, one that sticks with me particularly from here is um, the stress of a production release. You know, Have you ever been there pulling an all-nighter, or pulling an all-weekend shift? And we've got to get this out by Monday morning. And so we're there until Sunday late afternoon. And we've, you know, we've been up all day long and the day before. And 
Yeah. Just constant, like, oh, what's wrong on this server? The server's not working. I don't know. Just reboot it. Maybe that'll fix it. And yeah. that kind of chaos um, is one of the anti-patterns that they discuss. And I think that probably sticks with most people. Yeah, definitely. I've been in um, productions that uh, lasted the entire night. Um, I've also slept in the server room before. <laughs> it's nice and cold in the server room. Yeah, so, um, so they'll go over some of those. And, and I think that will resonate with just about any of you that have done software development uh, production releases before. Um, you may be coming at this track from a development perspective. You may be coming at it from an operations perspective, maybe an IT perspective. Um, but all of us are probably involved in some way or another getting our code out to production for our users to use. Um, so then after they discuss the anti-patterns, they really say, how can we do this better? There's got to be a better way. We, we shouldn't have so much stress around releasing code. And one of the things I liked about the book is um, the goal that they say is reducing cycle time, which comes directly from lean software, which is one of, you know, that's my chosen process, I guess, um, that I espouse to companies and whatever, you know, like. Yeah, I think we, uh, as a company, Crafting Bites, that Scott and I are involved in it, and our other partner, Ike Ellis, as well, um, we really like this book and we really like this topic because it really aligns with a lot of the philosophies we have as a consulting company. Um, a lot of times when we're called in to help a team out, a lot of the things that we're bringing to the table here are, are these ideas behind lean software development and reducing cycle times and delivering software value constantly. Um, so this book really aligns with, with our thinking. We, we really believe in, in a lot of the um, concepts that are discussed here. Um, so what the, one of the things they start to drive home also in that chapter is that there's this concept of a feedback loop. I built some software and um, one of the things we say internally, one of our principles here at CB, we talk about, uh, sorry, CB is Crafting Bytes. That's our own <laughs> internal. As well as Carlsbad. It's, yeah, also, yeah, it's Carlsbad. also Carlsbad. So uh, one of the things we say uh, a lot here is that, you know, the, the software has no value unless it's in the hands of users. What's the point of us sitting and toiling away at software for a month and not delivering it? There's no value in that. And we want to deliver value as often as possible. And we want that feedback. So they talk about this feedback loop and they say that feedback should be received as soon as possible. As soon as you have a piece of code that's functional, it should be deployed to users and used and that feedback sh loop should be completed. Yeah. And you and should take the feedback and, and produce the next version based on that. Right, yeah. So you're getting the feedback from the users, but there's also another like kind of more subtle feedback loop going on. Like if you're a developer and you change a line of code and then three months later it's deployed and there's a bug, you're like... Uh, what you know how you'll have to basically dive into the problem all over again whereas if you you know make the line the code change in the morning and it's released in the afternoon and there's some problem with it you know pretty much exactly where that is right mm -hmm. you don't have to uh, guess and do an archaeology session you know to, to right. find that out so so in going with like closing this feedback loop this really gets on again on the lean software approach what are the tools that we can use how can we go about having the confidence in our build that we can constantly release like that. So they talk a little bit about the first chapter um, briefly about some of the tools you might use. We're going to talk about things like um, continuous integration servers, things like um, Jenkins or Team City or GoCD or TFS Build. These are all um, software applications that allow us to continually build and produce releases of our software. Um, and hey, they I'm sorry. They, they talk about um, a, the, th the four things that make up an actual working piece of software is the executable code, which you know came from source of some type, but also the configuration, the host environment, and the data. Those four things together need to be thought of as being continually delivered. You know, sometimes the data is more just a you know migration script or something like that, but um, you know definitely the the executable code, the configuration, and the host that it's running on. Yeah, and they and they really drive home this point that. Um, you know, one of these subheaders here specifically says every check-in should lead to a potential release. And that's, for most people, that's probably kind of a paradigm shift for them. They, they don't consider that the code they just slammed into version control on a Friday afternoon and ran home, they don't consider that ready to go out. I was just checking in, but they really drive home this idea of we need to shrink the size and complexity of a release and we need to release often and reduce that pain and with doing that, every commit should produce uh, releasable software. And so your your project on the main line of your version control system is is always in a perpetual state of production readiness. It's, it's always ready to go to production. And if you can shift to that kind of mindset, um, then the 
the anti-pattern in the beginning we talked about of, of manual software releases that cause all this pain and you're working all week and that really uh, reduces all of that pain, goes away. It's just every commit. I've got a tool like a continuous integration server like a TeamCity or a Jenkins and those things can run a set of unit tests or automated tests. We'll talk about we'll talk about automated tests in our meeting too, the various forms, things like unit tests or behavior driven testing, integration testing. Um, and they, how they we, even go into like um, you know non functional require non functional testing like you know performance, performance or yeah. scalability mm -hmm. or security or things like that. And they talk about it all in the context of these things are all automated. Is as soon as I check in, all of my automated processes kick off on my on my continuous integration server. And if all of those pass and I get a green light, the software is ready to deliver. Yeah, and that 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 goes a long way towards reducing the stress that you were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. um, and so. Um, and, and again, they, they get into this and they say, in order for this to work, you have to automate almost everything. You, all of this has to happen on check-in and you need to have a green light, red light system. If it's green, we're good to go. That thing should be out and released into production. There's no reason to withhold that release if you've passed all of your te automated testing thresholds. It's as good as the previous version that was in production. So why would you hold it back? Right? You have the same level of test coverage. And so um, we'll talk a bit about that in the meeting as well. How can we achieve this goal of of, um, really of continuous delivery. As soon as I check in, can I deliver the, the software to my users? Um, and uh, they, they mentioned specifically, there are pain points along the way in building this process. And some of them are particularly painful, very, very painful. And they say, if it hurts, do it more frequently. Bring the pain forward is the idea kind of in, in lean software. It, if you've got something that's very painful and you know it's painful, just keep doing it over and over again until it becomes less painful and, and uh, prioritize those things to be done. And usually that means automating things, ensuring that there's no change, ensuring that's a repeatable process, that will reduce all that pain. And when you get rid of those big pain points, you end up with a, um, a much more um, calm release environment. Speaking of done, I like their definition of done uh, that they use here in the end of the last chapter, or uh, the first chapter is um, done is basically released into the hands of the customer. Like yeah. that is a definition of done that no one could, it's, yeah. it's you know, there's they always, have, in Scrum, there's the definition of done, right? And uh, yeah. is it done or is it done done? But here, yeah, that, that was my favorite mention. They, they said, uh, you've often heard a developer say that a story or feature is done, but then the project manager says, but is it done done? <laughs> And uh, I had an old project manager that used to say, is it rodeo done? She wanted to know, is it, is it done or is it rodeo done? Have you, have you roped the cow and it's completely done? And developers will always say something's done and it's never done because it you know, works on my machine, it's not done. It's, uh, again, remember software has no value unless it's in production, unless your users are actively using it. So um, it's not done until it's shipped to production. That's their definition of done. And, and if you take that definition of done, then it means every time I commit, I've got to get it into production or else I'm not done with my feature. Yeah. Uh, and then we'll move on to chapter two, which talks more specifically about configuration management. Yeah, so this is a, um, an area that's overlooked oftentimes when you're delivering uh, software to um, a new environment um, is the configuration of that environment, how the source code is configured to talk to its various external components. Um, and they have a very um, strict definition of if you have a good configuration management strategy, they ask you to answer a, a series of questions, which I would probably 90% of the people out there would fail. Like, I, I think I would fail one of them. Um, anyway, mm -hmm. I'm not gonna talk about which one. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, what exactly is included in this configuration management? Well, there's, uh, you know, the connection strings, the um, DNS files, firewall configuration, um, you know, basically everything that you would need to recreate a brand new machine with your source code on it from scratch and have that work, right? Mm -hmm. um, or not source code, but executable. Um, so that's what they're talking about with, uh, you know, configuration management. That's the configuration and they want you to keep it in version control. Uh, that's why they call it version control rather than uh, source control. Um, and then making sure that, that uh, both the software and the configuration are being constantly deployed and that the, uh, that configuration is being tested over and over again as you're moving it through the different environments. Yeah, so they, when they talk about version control, um, we'll talk about it in our meeting as well. We'll mention things like 
Um, T TFS has a version control component. Uh, SVN, you're probably familiar with. That's a pretty common one. Um, Git. Subversion. Yeah, yeah subversion. Yeah. yeah, sorry. Subversion is very common per force. Um, also, like the modern approach these days is a lot of people use Git. It's a distributed version control system. We'll mention a little bit about what the differences are there. And um, the one difference, and I think this is where most of the people we run into would probably fail, is keep absolutely everything in version control. Most people see it as source control, and so only source code goes in there. Um, even to the extent that they don't view database stuff as source control. A SQL script's not source. Well, it actually it is source code, um, but more than that, this is version control. It's not source control. We want to anything that needs to be version should be in version control, and they say keep absolutely everything in version control except oh, except passwords. Yeah, yeah, except yeah, yeah. Passwords. yeah. Don't don't put your passwords in, in yeah. version control. Yeah, that, that's that means if someone gets your repository, they shouldn't have the keys to the production server necessarily. Yeah. So uh, one of the trickier areas is around managing dependencies of your software, right? You have these third-party components. Uh, do you, you know, do you check those in or do you not? And they talk about, you know. It's not always desirable to to leave them out because then, as you get a new um, team member, they're forced to basically download the entire world. Um, you know, but my view on that is it is desirable because you only get started once and you check in and um, update far more often than that. So now I have a, I have a question on that because I think it's kind of interesting. A lot of most modern languages now are run off some sort of packaging system. In .NET, mm -hmm. we talk about NuGet and Node, we talk about NPM, Python, we talk about PIP, Ruby, we talk about gems. Basically, every modern language has some sort of packaging. And so what we're talking about here is the third-party packages you depend on. Your opinion is don't check them into source control. What check, about Check in the, the definition of what you depend yeah. on, but yeah. not the packages themselves. Yeah, and so opinion. a lot of the packaging libraries, NuGet, I'm not entirely sure, NPM for sure has this. When you install a package, the version is fuzzy. It's like, give me this or greater. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. The, the carrot in, new, in, in, in uh, NPM. Yeah. Right, right. And so since that's kind of the default in a lot of cases, if a new developer comes on six months later or an NPM a week later, they're going to get a new version. And now you've got version mismatch between developers. Right. A lot of times it doesn't matter. I tend to be a fan of upgrade all the things, always be on latest for security reasons and you know, breaking changes are not, in my experience, have not been that big of a well, deal. Well, you know, I, I feel like if you are going to be away from a project for a, a significant period of time, like you're sort of wrapping up uh, a phase and then it'll be, you know, used for a while and then there'll be a, you know, subsequent release that you'll come back to later. At that point in uh, NPM, you can go through and rather than doing the caret, you'd use like the tilde or yeah, or, or an actual version if you want. Just lock it down mm -hmm. and that way you're guaranteed. And then when you come back to it later, now you can do the carrots and now you can, you mm -hmm. know, build and, and test the various components and you can do that one at a time in a more, um, in an easier fashion, mm -hmm. I guess. Cool. Uh, and then they talk about, you know, managing components as you get a really complex system. You've got, you know, uh, things on the higher end of the UI, um, depending on, you know, like maybe business components and depending on data components and, and et cetera, and how you manage those things. And you really need to think there about what you're changing together. So don't just make a component out of your data access layer and make a component out of your business layer and then make a component out of your UI because oftentimes those are changed together, right? You'll add a new thing in the database and add some business logic around dealing with that thing that you've just added and add a UI around it, right? And that creates kind of hell for you. Rather, slice it vertically, you know, this is an area that is used independently of these other things and I can version that as a component, right? Um, one of the things I think, as we talk about this chapter, one of the things that we'll probably bring up in this first meeting, at least as I mentioned, will be Docker. If you've been paying attention to the DevOps, general DevOps topic in the last year or so, you, I'm sure you've heard of Docker. We'll talk about how Docker helps you manage this kind of idea of a vertical slice of a complete, com of complete environment that, and, yeah. and fully configured, fully bootstrapped, up and running, deployable as a, as a unit. Mm -hmm. um, you know, which includes source code, operating system, operating system configurations, third-party software dependencies, all of that stuff, all yep. in one nice package and deployed. Yeah. And a nice, uh, yeah, easy to check in um, package. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you're able to actually yeah. manage the versioning of your, basically your Docker container. We'll yeah. talk a bit about that. So they talk about managing software configuration, um, and you know there's a tendency for developers to make you know the configuration infinitely flexible, and they talk about how that's a bad idea. 
Um, you know, Bob Martin, one of my uh, heroes, uh, talks about, you know, Yagni, you ain't gonna need it. And uh, he has his bullet theory, you know, you put it out there with the simplest thing. And then, you know, as change comes, you're kind of taking a bullet, but you protect yourself from further bullets in that area, right? And so over time, you've built up this set of armor that makes your software very robust. Um, the types of configuration, you know, um, you can have uh, configuration that's at build time, at packaging time, at deployment time, or at run time. And uh, it says definitely prefer like deployment time over build time, you know, that's sort of very hard coded at, uh, at build time, even though it has a sidebar talking about how Java makes that hard. <laughs> Um, let's see, then we have the special don't check passwords into source control. Um, and then it talks about how you access and model configuration, how it is that you retrieve these settings. And it talks about how you can put them in a central location like a database or a, a service and use uh, things to call. But the, the API should just be give me this property. Um, given that I am this application, I have this version, and I'm on this particular environment, because that would... And one of the things we didn't mention in the first chapter they talk about, it, you'll hear, is that all of these principles that they're talking about, they do reference Java a lot, just because that's their background, both of these engineers are primarily Java-based, <clears throat> and one of them works at ThoughtWorks with Martin Fowler, his big Java shop, but they say this process scales, they've, they've worked on large enterprise projects and applied these, they've worked in small startups and applied these, so it isn't isn't unique to one software environment. You don't have to be a three-person, you know, scrappy company to make this work. You could be a giant uh, Fortune 500 company and, and still apply these principles. And, and you probably should because you're the ones that probably have the most pain. Yeah. You know, the big, gigantic, monolithic, yeah. humongous enterprise apps are where these deployments become very painful. Yep. Um, one of the things they mentioned in uh, on page 46 in chapter two is talking about promoting, um, which I thought is kind of a an interesting use case for, um, you know. Uh, taking something that is already built, but now it needs a new set of configuration because you're promoting it from one environment to another. Um, and then they talk about how to actually manage your environments. And that's where Docker really comes in and can shine. Um, and they talk about tools like uh, Puppet and CF Engine that they use uh, here, but, you know, Chef, and there's, um, you know, the, the one from PowerShell, which D... C something. I can't remember. Got me on that one. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Anyway. I'm going to use PowerShell. Yeah. Use Bash, a proper shell. Yeah. Well, bash all the things. Yes, 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 yes. Bash all the things. Uh, so then they talk about, uh, you know, tools to manage your environment and um, the, uh, the change process, you know, how, um, uh, who should be able to make changes to the environment, basically. Yeah. And how you... Uh, control that for production, right? You don't want anyone going in and making a change, but you definitely want more than one person to be able to make the change yeah. because they could get hit by a bus, et cetera. Right, right. And that very was cool. it for chapter two. Very cool. So that's um, that's, a, that's a very good uh, overview, I think, of the two chapters we're going to cover. We mentioned a couple of technologies in this discussion here. So if you haven't heard of the things we mentioned, um, like uh, Docker or um, Git or Team City or Jenkins or- Yeah, we talked, about, we talked about uh, source control first or version control as they call it, like Git, mm -hmm. TFS. We talked about the CI servers, Team City or Jenkins or- um, TFS build or, or Go CD. Go CD or, or, yeah, or, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then we have, uh, once you've, You've built it, then you have to worry about your environments and the deployment aspects. So Octopus Deploy or, um, uh, you know, the environments, maybe cloud. We'll talk about, you know, yeah. a little bit. Yeah, and, we talk, and then like Docker and we maybe talk about like kind of services like Heroku and how that works. And mm -hmm. we talk a little about Chef and Puppet and all. There's a bunch of tools that fit into all of the different places to make this work. So we'll talk about that. We'll talk about, you know, getting the confidence to release constantly. Um, mm -hmm. So we hope to see you join us um, this month. Uh, if you go to sdtig.com, we'll have the meetup information if you're here in, in San Diego area. We're up in Carlsbad um, and we meet once a month, like I said. So sdtig.com will take you to meetup and you'll see our scheduled meetup. And if you can't make it, if you're out of town, then we will live stream. Uh, still join the meetup so you can get the live stream link. And uh, we hope to see you this month. All right. Thanks. Bye.